let's see. All right, welcome. November 2nd, some sack pie. Before we get started, let's look at this month's pop quiz. This is another one from past presenter Mike Driscoll's Twitter project called Teach Me Pie, wherein he quizzes his audience with various Python things. So this one's pretty straightforward. It's a demonstration of the star operator, or rather a test of your knowledge. Has anyone had a chance to think this one through and venture a guess? I know a few of us can pretty much do this one without much thinking. Sure, Rob, what do you think? I know Dan knows this one. DN, no, no doubt. Yeah, sure. What, what do you think this one does? Uh, what, what's our answer? A, B, C, or D. Is it a C? I do believe it is. It, uh, so the measure, the, I only know this because of the function. Like when you have a star before that, you can have a list as <clears throat> a function argument, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, same same thing. Yeah, so let's let's do it real quick for the YouTubes. So it's pretty straightforward. It was a star b c is equal to one, two, three, four, five. And so when we print that out, what it's gonna do to evaluate this is first do the first value a. So that's going to be one. And then it's going to do the last value C. That'll be five. And then the star operator unpacks everything in between. So as Shurov points out, we should see B. Uh, or was it C? In any case, when we print B, we should see two, three, four, five. And I'm oh, sorry, two, three, four. And there we go. Good times. Gotta love iterables. Okay, let's get back to the presentations. Welcome everyone. So we've got two presenters tonight. We've got a short one from a regular of ours, Dr. Tani Islam from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. He's working on a whole bunch of cool stuff and occasionally he is given license to talk about a little of it. He also does some cool stuff on his own. He shared something, I think two meetups back for a little project that I actually enjoy myself. Uh, but this time we're going to talk a, a little bit about some of the really high level sciencey stuff he does with a thing called PMesh Chapbook. Yep, yep, yep. I can explain exactly what that means, but he did talk about it in the past. Something with like lasers and plastic, tiny little plastic cups exploding from the heat. Uh, from but, the lasers yes that's right that's and right. uh if you can if your screen's good enough what you're seeing is sort of a mesh so you know you you mesh this up and it's got enough structure that it can accurately model the physics of what's happening here and so this is like you know these are the red and I guess orange boundaries these denote the boundaries and these are two different materials and if you can look at it, these are all quadrilateral meshes over here, quadrilateral zones. And that's what I mean by meshing. And uh, I guess I can go to it if you want. What is a chapbook? I think a chapbook is just a tiny novella, you know, sort of a little booklet you can hold in your hand. It's not as small as a pamphlet, but it's not a full-fledged novel. So like a chat book, it doesn't promise to be that much. It just promises to be not so big as it's unwieldy, but big enough to be useful. This is sort of a home, like a, a, a show and tell project I did. I presented this at a conference a few weeks ago and it's, um, I figure it's relevant since the tooling is made in Python and it uses a, a basically a geometric and meshing tool that's also made in Python. And I call it the PMesh chat book. 
So uh, unlike a lot of these things, since it's more show and tell, uh, although I you know, was able to fully release this presentation, uh, I haven't been able, I haven't gotten a release on all the code that you know I uh, used to demonstrate you know this stuff or to show here. So it'll just be a show rather than tell and demonstrate like you know examples of using my Python code. So I hope you're okay with that. It's a little less interactive and hands-on. Uh, not like a, I guess the snowflake demo that'll happen in like maybe 15 minutes or so. All right. So you know the statement, you know, meshing remains hard, but it shouldn't be impossible. And so I, I figured instead of spending a lot of time redoing my poster, I just uh, will slap it into just uh, convert the poster into presentation, which is like, okay, here are the bullet points. And uh, instead of going through all this, I'll just say, you know, here's here's what I actually, you know, demonstrated in that poster like uh, what it's what meshing what do i mean by meshing a geometry for the physics problems that i and others at livermore labs look at describing at a high level detail what this pmesh chat book is which is really a mid-level python module that makes this process a little easier the, the geometric zoning and meshing um and then you know Finally, end with an example of, of its application to the real problems that I, you know, try to simulate, and which I've shown, I think, at other meetups. I mean, other previous SACPI meetups, you know, over the past year and the past few months. So, what I mean is, like, this is the whole process that I mean by, you know, meshing the. Uh, the like experiments or other things that you know I in the lab care about. So what I mean by this is you start off with uh, these four. You have these four steps. Uh, and the first thing is you know you define your universe, this box, this bigger rectangular box, and the parts in it. So there's uh, there's this void. You know, just the look at the things that I show with the arrows. This whole ROM is, you just think of it as a spherical shell. And there's another thing called a void box in, inside, which is the same material as a void. Uh, step two, you actually divide this thing up into shapes, you know, two dimensional shapes that all have four edges to them. You see that here? Uh, I, I leave this as an exercise to the reader, but every single you know, thing that I cut up this geometry into has four edges to them. That's an important point. The third step is, okay, I have basically a geometry and I've got to divide it up into smaller zones called a mesh to make, uh, you know, basically the thing run to, you know, model the physics I care about accurately. And so an important part of that is, okay, you identify a thing called a constraint loop. The, the way to think of it is, you know, you see each edge has four face, each face has four edges in there. It's kind of, I don't see, how do I do some kind of, do you guys see this arrow here? Yeah, we can see your cursor. Okay, the cursor, yeah. So you see how each uh, face has four edges. The idea behind it is the opposite edges have the same number of zones and same sort of zoning strategy. Like uh, it could be either uniform or over here, it could be geometric, like start off small here, go to bigger here. Uh, those are really the only two things you have to care about. So the idea behind here is how to figure out uh, a, a zoning strategy is you define, you know, not only you know the opposite edges uh, for a given face, but you propagate it all the way you know from the beginning to the end of the whole geometry, geometric domain. And this is the thing called a constraint loop family. That is everything, all the edges here, 
have the same sort of zone spacing. So you define like a, a beginning point and, you know, basically the, the edge. And you say, oh, is it going to be uniform or is it going to be geometric? And then finally, you, you know, you define all the things. And in the end, you say, okay, you know, there's this kind of zoning here along these edges and that kind of zoning along all the other edges for everything in your final geometry. And I know it's kind of hard to see here, but you end up with this thing called uh, a mesh, which consists of, you know, all these, you know, four edge, you know, four sided zones all throughout the problem. Oop. Okay. So why P mesh? I guess uh, this makes more sense to, to, I guess, the scientists that I work with. But this is sort of a, a useful high level tool that's um, nice for our day-to-day -day work because it has a GUI. So by that, it means it's, uh, it's easy to see uh, when you make a mistake. So, and it's nicely interactive. So easy to see when you make a mistake, you don't have to start from the beginning and say, oh, I made a mistake here, let me fix that. And then, you know, move on and on until you have something that works rather than starting from the beginning each time you make a mistake. It's Python and I figured, you know, this is at least, it has some intersection with our group because this is a Python meetup and this is a Python tool and this PMesh chapbook is Python. And one of the nice things about Python as a lot of you are aware, it's uh, if you have a Python problem, in a lot of cases, you can just look at Google for an answer um, for your problems. Uh, the final thing, it turns out the thing that makes uh, you know this module work without my having to uh, like uh, infer membership is this thing called hashability. So I don't know how much you guys are aware of um, the nice feature of sets and dictionaries and things like that is to figure out, oh, how, how do I identify, and this is not the computer science answer, that this object, this, you know, this object in memory is the same as that object in memory. I mean, they're equivalent to each other. Uh, it's uh, you identify it with a hash, just basically a, an identifier. Because this tooling has this thing called hashability in it, membership is very easy. Uh, a vertex, any kind of geometric object is uniquely identified, and it makes ownership and set operations easy. If that stuff didn't exist in uh, this, this tool called PMesh, then, you know, I'm not computer scientist enough to bolt on this, you know, functionality on top of it and make it work because I would have to basically create, uh, you know, a hash representation myself, which I'm not smart enough to do. So in this case, what it means is because hashability exists, membership is very easy to identify. That is, it's only like a line of uh, Python code, which unfortunately I can't show that, uh, immediately tells me this is a vertex and I can easily identify, oh, these are the edges that own that vertex. Or if I have an edge, these are the faces uh, that own that edge, which allows me, you know, to, you know, in a, like two or three lines of code, just implement a method that, you know, recursively propagates, you know, uh, opposite edges from each other all the way from, you know, one end of the domain to the other. So I know more stuff. So, but, uh, uh, team, yeah. is, this, is the code confidential and that's why you can't show it? Yeah, it's uh, technically official use only. Okay. Only by association because it, you know, calls Python methods in the API of a, a PMesh, which is OUO, official use only too. Right. And that's really the real reason. 
the reason sure, that's a good having reason. this conversation, uh, what was that, Rob? I, I'd say that's a good, this, it, it being confidential is a, is a very good reason not to show it. <laughs> yeah, there's a way to even get my code if I wanted to, to be releasable, but it's a whole other thing too. Hmm. Um, it just turned out to be that this presentation, uh, the postered version of this presentation was deemed to not only be just OUO, but also completely open. So because of that, you know, I figured Woody said there was room in the in this meetup for me to talk about it. So that's what I did. I figured I can talk for a few minutes about this. Yeah. And that's, yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to only show a little bit of the functionality here, but in red are sort of the very useful things that I'm like using. I, I, I'm thinking the more interesting things that, you know, I've implemented as part of the PMesh, PMesh chat, which I guess a mistake already right there. You know, the construction of those constraint loop families. So there's a pre-validation step, you know, after I make my cut of the geometry into faces, it's a check that says, okay, does every face have four edges? If not, then try again. And because PMesh has a GUI, you can easily just then illuminate those faces because you might have a lot of them. Uh, just color the faces that don't have four edges. And you can say, oh, okay, I made a mistake here. And the post validation is, Okay, if I define all those separate loops, like, you know, those families of opposite edges for every face, um, I've got to make sure that every edge is in only one family. And just if there are any edges that are, you know, not in any family, okay, I've made a mistake. I've been missing something. And the second bullet point is, you know, something, um, PMesh has a Python, uh, you know, virtual machine inside it, but uh, it is, uh, it intersects a bit with what we consider like a standard Python virtual machine that's, you know, generally portable, something like a Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Hub server that, you know, has a Python VM underneath. Uh, the nice thing about it is, you know, you can export the geometric information in a JSON format and I've got some tooling. It's almost at the API level, you know, built, I guess I would put in the PMS chat book that would take that information and, you know, put it into, you know, have a create matplotlib images out of it, which was actually, you know, what I did here and here. Those are all matplotlib images. So, you know, you saw a little bit of this here. Uh, I figured the most interesting thing, at least the one that I, you know, presented was this identifying a constraint loop family, right? Here's a control point, you know, a start or stop, and here's an edge. You can, it could be anything. And you say, okay, you want to make it either uniform or geometric. That's step one. Step two, you know, you just identify, you know, with this edge, the two, the one to two edges that are, you know, opposite it. You know, uh, you look at the faces that own that edge. There are two faces. And then you look at the opposite edges for that. You, you know, do this process recursively until you reach the problem boundary, your, you know, geometric domain. and Really, that's it. I mean, that's just one constraint family. And then you re repeat it for all the other constraint families, constraint loop families that exist. Hmm. And of this, course, yeah. I, I would say this is kind of a, this is a topic that a lot of people would have difficulty relating to. Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it is um, very specialized. I, I do admit, yes. Yeah. So it's, so the the part about using the part about it being hashable, I, I understood that. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the applications for this, so um, so when I was a student, uh, we mm -hmm. worked with the um, 
uh, Department of Energy energy simulation, right? To, to look at how at heat flow. Um, okay. In buildings. And so this seems like it's sort of like that. Um, yeah, it helps set up the zoning for your problem. So if you have something in two dimensions, right? If you want to maybe solve for an electric field or figure out, uh, you know, a mesh to do diffusive, you know, diffusive heat flow across your problem, um, this might tell you, for instance, how to do the meshing properly, how to how to zone up the separate the geometry that you have to incorporate, you know, the physics you care about. Right. That's, uh, I guess, at a high level, here's why, you know, people care about this stuff. And the PMESH chapbook is just uh, a Python module to, you know, remove a lot of the manual, remove a lot of manual steps to it um, to, you know, make it easier to, you know, sort of more robustly, reproducibly, uh, in a simple manner, set up your, you know, your your problem zoning. But yes, it is heavily, heavily geometry or physics, physics focused. Mm -hmm. So there we are. And, uh, you know, I figure I'm not going to show that again. But in the end, you you've set up basically uh, a prescription to how to zone your problem or specifically how to zone up each face, like, you know, one edge and the other edge. And then in the end, your, you know, tool says, okay, this uh, basically zoning prescription is valid and here's what you end up with. I, I realize it's kind of hard to see. Oh. Can you do those zoning things in three dimensions? You probably could. I just haven't uh, done any three-dimensional meshing or zoning. So uh, it is an extra degree, but this is um, this is sort of a what's called a logical block structure, which um, is a simpler way of you know zoning up a problem. So not having done it, I will say it's straightforward, but don't uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, because I have, since I haven't done it, uh, you know, I can't really, uh, speak authoritatively on whether, you know, this logical zoning structure is, uh, you know, basically something that would easily work or, you know, see, easily be applicable to 3D. So I'm just going to go through this quickly. I mean, all I've shown, I guess, at the beginning, although it's kind of hard to see is, just a simple example, but I applied it to, you know, non-trivial actual, uh, you know, models of experiments that I and my team field on laser facilities at Livermore and uh, Omega, which is at Rochester. This is just a, you know, representative top platform. And the thing is, okay, just as an example, here's how I, you know, cut up the geometry and put in the parts. And here's, you know, just a single constraint loop, same as before, but a much more complicated geometry. And in this case, there's 13 of those constraint loop families. And here's the final, you know, hot final mesh with, I think, one, two, three, four separate kinds of regions, separate kinds of parts in it. Laser goes in here, it shines x-rays, which cause this part to ablate, and you look at how the shock, you know, goes out this end. And I guess that's it. <laughs> I guess I know it's uh, somewhat unusual, but uh, is there anything else any of you guys want me to talk about in detail or related to this or something else? Wow, uh, I, I don't even know where to begin on that one. That was, that was dense. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, in the end, maybe it's hard to believe or, you know, for me, it's easy for me to see because uh, I remember the bad old days when I didn't have something like this there to help me. And stuff that took maybe now takes maybe half a day would take like a week and a half or two weeks or longer. Plus, if I changed one thing, 
uh, I would be like, oh God, I, I don't know how to unknit this sweater because I've got to go look at these hard-coded variables or hard-coded settings and then, you know, start from the beginning, you know, figure out that thing, change that one thing. And, you know, not only would it take me like a week and a half or more to do something like this, but like maybe four days if I wanted to put another part in here. So, so yeah. from, from, from your presentation, um, the thing that I'm not clear on is what, what aspects of this are confidential and which aspects aren't? I think I think what you the said was the that... part is I guess the implementation, like like here's the code that does this, and I, I guess and uh, but you know the concepts that I'm showing here at a high level or a useful level or like an objective level, that's uh, completely open. It might not be clear, but it's you know I can talk about it. In, in any context. Right. So um, it seems like this is something that could have applications in other areas. For example, uh, I watched a, a presentation from a lady who does computer graphics. And mm -hmm. so she talked She talked about um, uh, 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 geometric, uh, geometric algebra instead of linear algebra. Or mm -hmm. um, I, I forget the, the name of the guy uh, who who came up with geometric algebra, um, but uh, she gave she gave a, a presentation that uh, was that, that that I could follow and uh, while not being a domain expert, right? Um, and so she talked about um, this idea of uh, of um, uh, things being closed. And yeah. at which point that that closure uh, breaks, right? So there's you, so you can do addition and subtraction, or you can do you can do addition and the counting numbers. But when you have subtraction, then you have to go into the integers. And when you do division, then you go into the reals, right? And yeah. when and under certain circumstances, you go into the complex numbers, and then another set of circumstances, you go into the Hamiltonians. Um, hmm. but, um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it was, it was, um, uh, and of course some, some really cool computer graphics to, to, to demonstrate these. Um, so I'm sure that this has a lot of applications for thing for, uh, computer graphics, uh, and maybe things like, uh, GIS. Right. Good. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the uh, the thing that I think makes it sort of easier to see is, OK, if you have like a number of basically zone spacing along this edge and a zone uh -huh. spacing along this edge, right, those opposite edges of a face, what's well, got, you know, it's basically some kind of either rectangle or some kind of thing that can be deformed into a rectangle or from a rectangle and all you've got to do at least as a high level not somebody in mathematical geometry is you know you just match opposite you know nodes along along the zone from each other you know you just propagate lines across there like on on each opposite basically it's effectively X or Y coordinate, right? Uh -huh. You grid it up. Uh, and this is simple because it's uniform here, uniform there. And so it looks like each zone is a nice rect rectangle. I mean, every zone is a quad, but in this case, they're a nice rectangle. You know, all you have to have is these lines can't intersect each other, you know, uh -huh. as they propagate left and right. And you get basically a logical you know, quadrilateral meshing zoning structure. Well, every single, you know, edge of face here is, you could sort of deform into a rectangle or a square. And you've got, you know, basically the same idea for each, uh, each face. And so because of that, I mean, I guess I could figure out the algorithm myself to do the zoning, you know, for each face. But it's, 
I guess, fairly straightforward. The only thing you need to have is that those lines, you know, along one coordinate axis mm -hmm. uh, don't intersect with each other as they propagate, you know, in the perpendicular direction. Uh, that's that's really all there is, at least for this sort of what's called logical block structure meshing. It's simple enough that uh, even I can understand it. <laughs> right. well, everything is, yeah, everything is basically like, you know, uh, a deformed rectangular mesh. Awesome. Well, thanks for that. I, hopefully we get to see some updates. Maybe some of the the rest of it will become declassified and we can have a continuation. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, thanks for that. All right, well, up next, Dash, before I, it, before you take it over, I'm going to do a quick little intro here for you. A few months ago, we had Dash Desai from Snowflake come and present showed us some pretty cool stuff and he's got some some more for us just came off his own uh showcase day the other day snow day it's just yesterday um, but this time we're gonna learn a little bit about how to use snowflakes snow park for uh data engineering and some like interesting ml applications all right well dash you ready to go yeah, so today we're going to talk about the image recognition, right? This was from the last time. No, oh, I'm sorry. You know what? Screw yeah. up on that. Uh, no, it's okay. <laughs> no worries. I think I might have caught it. Sorry about that. Anyway, and, uh, yeah, this is the, the the image recognition. He's going to show us some stuff with the generative AI as well as uh, being able to identify what images are. Uh, I'll just swap the slide in the, in the export. No worries. How much time do I have? Because I want to make sure I'm mindful of everyone's time. We've got this blocked out until 9 p.m. Pacific. So you've got 64 minutes, if you like. Okay, cool. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, do you guys see my web browser? Yep. If you could zoom in the font, that'd be great. Yep, I can see it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Zoom in more or um if you, yeah, if you could uh whatever command plus a little that that's good. That's good. Okay. All right. So what I'm gonna do is basically show the application and then we'll backtrack. Like I'll show you the code, what it means. So the idea is definitely not to talk just about Snowflake, but it's part of the solution and then other parts are PyTorch and Streamlit, which is also a Python framework for writing web applications really quickly without knowing HTML and CSS. Okay, so the first application I want to show you is I'm going to upload a file. Let's just pick one, this puppy right here. So what's happening right now is the image is being uploaded uh, the data in hex is being stored in a Snowflake table, and there is a user-defined function that's written in Python using PyTorch model that's going to give us a prediction. So here you go. So here's the image I picked, and then this is the prediction. Right? It's pretty cool. Uh, we can try a few more. Like let's just pick one at random and see what it does. Okay. So the, the three things that I'm using here are Stone Park for Python, Streamlit, and PyTorch, like I mentioned. Okay, so here we go. Here's the image I picked, and then here's the uh, the predicted label for that. It's pretty nice. Um, it's pretty specific and looks like pretty accurate. I don't know all the breeds, but looks like uh, uh, it's a, it's a, some kind of a pit bull. Okay, so let's see how this was. Uh, made. So for that, I'm going to switch over to Visual Studio Code. So do you guys see Visual Studio now? Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah. So if you use Visual Studio, there's a uh, there's really cool Snowflake uh, extension uh, that you can download for free. And once you do that, once you uh, put in your credentials to uh, log into your account, you can 
from here, you can basically do anything that you would do within Snowflake's UI. So I have a table called campaign span. I can do select star from campaign span. Any, any SQL that you can imagine, you can run in here. It's pretty cool. So you don't have to go back and forth between Snowflake and, and your ID of, uh, of choice. Um, okay, so let's look at the code. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this. So here's the code. As you can see, it's all Python. So Snowpark for Python is also a Python library that you can install using pip or conda. So you'll see up here, I've imported that, I've imported Streamlit, and then a bunch of other libraries I'm using within this application. Now, everything you see here, starting with SD, obviously, is Streamlit. Um, that's how I've uh, you know, labeled it up here. So I'm just uh, first setting some page configs, layout wide, page title, and so forth. Again, a little bit of more configuration as far as the web page goes. But then here's the, the actual code that's going to do stuff for us. So this Python function here um, is basically creating a session object uh, using the credentials that I've passed in. Once I have the session object, then I can interact with my Snowflake account to do whatever, pretty much whatever I want to do. Okay. Now, this piece of code right here is basically for allowing the user to upload a file. So Streamlit has something called file uploader. So that's how I'm uploading a file. And then I'm converting that into um, uh, bytes data in hex. Uh, again, that's just part of Streamlit. So I don't actually have to write a whole lot of code. Hmm. I'm just generating a random file name so I can assign that to the image that was uploaded. Then I'm creating a pandas data frame using the file name and then the bytes data. Now, one of the cool things you can do with Snowpark is also whatever data you may have on the client side, for example, in a pandas data frame, you can write that into a table in Snowflake by calling write pandas. And I'm passing in the pandas data frame and this is the name of the table, okay? So if I go back here, this is the table in my Snowflake account. And that has uh, all the images that I'm being uh, that I've uploaded from the application. Now, once that image is stored in my Snowflake table, then I'm calling the user-defined function that I've written in Python, passing in the image bytes, and um, and I'm I'm basically getting a predicted label out of it. And then the way I'm basically only processing that row is by the unique file name in the where clause. And once I get that, I display that um, both the image itself and the predicted label. Okay, so pretty straightforward. So you'll see there's only 70 lines of code. You don't actually have to know CSS, HTML. You can write these pretty cool web applications. I know it's not well, you know, there's not a whole lot of elements or um, UI elements, if you will, in the application, but there's another example that I'll show where there's a lot more interactivity happening in the application and you, you can create those applications without knowing uh, HTML and CSS. Okay, so the next thing I wanna cover is how did I uh, write this user-defined function that's taken in the image uh, bytes data and giving us the predicted label. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch to this notebook right here. Again, this notebook is using Snowpark Python library. So you can see up here that I've imported and a bunch of other things like pandas, cache tools, and things like that. Just like the Streamlit application, I'm creating a session object using the same connection JSON file I have. And then before I we look at the user-defined uh, function code, I just want to kind of explain how user-defined functions operate in Snowflake. So let's say you have a function, Python function, just your custom code that you've written uh, call calculate distance, for example, in this case. The way you tell Snowflake that this is a user-defined function that has to be run in Snowflake is by applying add UDF decorator. So once you do that, it passes through object serializer, goes through Snowflake connector to authenticate everything. And then that gets, your code gets converted into bytecode, which then runs in Snowflake in a secure Python runtime sandbox. There you also have access to SQL Engine. And then the most important thing here is the built-in Anaconda packages. 
So Snowflake has partnered with Anaconda to provide thousands of packages to developers. The reason behind this is so you don't have to actually worry about versioning. You don't have to worry about security of these packages. These are curated packages by Anaconda. And let me show you um, how many packages we have. So here's the URL repo.anaconda.com packages Snowflake. These are all the packages that are uh, installed on the server side in Snowflake for you to use out of the box. So this is like thousands. And there's also uh, different versions of Python supported. So if you count all of these, there's like 20,000 packages that you have at your disposal to use out of the box in Snowflake. Okay, so let me go back to the code here. Um, okay, now let's look at the code. So before we do that, um, for this application, the PyTorch train pre-trained models I'm using are basically I've downloaded them from, um, let me pull up the site here. Uh, I just wanna give them a shout out for making these available. So if I go here. So these the models that I'm using in my application are basically I downloaded from here. And uh, I just wanna thank these folks for making these available. So once I have downloaded those, which you can see right here, so I have the labels, uh, text, and then these are the model files. So what you can do in Snowflake is, um, let me go back to my Python Jupyter notebook, for example. Yeah. So you can upload these files to a Snowflake stage. So then you can add those as dependencies for a user-defined function. So you can use session.file.put image and then where you want these to be stored. So this is just the name of an internal stage that I have in my Snowflake account. So once I have these files uploaded and available in my stage, what I can then do is add them as dependencies on the user-defined function. So now I'm saying I want to use these three files and also these packages uh, for my logic or for my code. Okay, And then here's some Python code. Uh, I'm loading the mapping. I'm loading the mo model right here, this code. And then this is the actual function that I showed you when I was calling this from Streamlit application that will actually give me the predicted label. And then I've decorated that with add UDF, means this code is basically going to be converted into bytecode and will run securely in a secure sandbox in Snowflake in your account right where data lives. Um, and then some of these parameters are op uh, optional, like replace true is permanent true and, and stage location. So replace true means every time I run this code, you know, it's going to replace what the, the code that existed before. So in case if I change some code and things like that. Is permanent true means it's going to be persisted, persisted. So you can also call this UDF from um, snow site or or that's the UI. Um, that's the default UI for working with uh, Snowflake objects. So this is Snowflake's UI. This is how you interact with uh, your databases, schemas, applications, what have you. And um, this entire list, you can also look at that within Snowflake. So if I run this, we'll see how many, okay, so there's the counts already down there. But basically, all those packages are, there's like 20 plus thousand packages in in um, uh, in Snowflake that's, uh, that you can use in your user-defined functions and stroke procedures. And there's also, for example, you can run this to see there's multiple versions of different packages supported. So there's all kinds of versions and also runtimes. So currently, uh, Snowpark for Python supports 3.8 Python, 3.9, and 3.10, uh, also 3.11. Yeah, it's cool. So anyway, so um, let me go back to the notebook. So that's what this means, is permanent true. Basically, I can call that function from SQL as well. So here's the user-defined function, passing image bytes, which is part of the uh, images table. So let me just run that really quick. And then we'll run this. 
So this table has the file name and the image bytes, which is being, these records are being inserted from the application. And then I can call the same user defined function from here, just like how I'm calling this from Streamlit application. So here you will see predictive labels. So, so that's the same function I'm also calling from Streamlit app. So that's how I created this um, user defined function and have uh, securely deployed on to Snowflake in my account. Now, let me also show you a different application that I've built uh, and it's this one. So a lot of the code is very similar. So everything except uploading a file is the same. But here, what I'm doing is I'm actually uh, using OpenAI to generate the image in real time. So I'm just going to type in some random uh, description, say a uh, puppy playing in snow. And what's happening right now, I'm going out to OpenAI. It's going to give me an image based on the description. And then I'll call the same user-defined function to tell us what's what kind of animal or puppy or what have you is in the uh, image. So there you go. So this is a randomly generated image by Dolly2, and then this is the predicted label from, from my user-defined function. Let's say a uh, cat, just say- Do a uh, frog riding a unicycle. Huh? A frog riding a unicycle. Riding a unicycle. Oh, See what happens. <laughs> now, just to just to be clear, the the model that I'm using was uh, trained on cats and dogs images, so we'll see what comes up with the safety <laughs> pin. <laughs> hey, not bad. <laughs> not bad. Anyone else want to try a prompt? It's a safety pin, though. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, the model was trained on cats and dogs images of cats and dogs, but no, maybe uh, it's, it's taking this as like the, so, I mean, it kind of looks like safety pin. So there's, there was a lot of kind of moving through this quickly, but yeah. uh, what, what model exactly was trained on cats and dogs? So that's uh, this one right here. Let me go back. Um, this is the, the model that I've taken directly from here. So it's so, MobileNet V3. Yeah, correct. Uh, and I believe, let me um, go back to my... So the other thing I want to, uh, right before we get into uh, your question, if anyone wants to follow along and create exactly what I've created, I'm going to put this link uh, here in chat. So there's a step-by-step -step instructions on everything that I've showed uh, showed you so far, like what is Snowpark, what is Streamlit, PyTorch, and what you'll need, basically a Snowflake account, and optionally, uh, if you want to also build the second app, you need OpenAI account and OpenAI key. And then if you follow along, I'm, I've explained like what the code does um, and everything else in both applications, we use the same user-defined function and also um, uh, the link to the actual model I'm using. So here I'm basically using, it's the same link that, that uh, I showed you earlier. So if I click on it, we should see the same GitHub repo. So I, I think I'm using one of these models, model uh, net v3, which I've... Uh, How do you know what it's actually trained on? This was, uh, I did find an article that linked me here. Um, let's see. I'm not sure if the information's in here, but there's an article that I found where um, I found the link to this, and that's how. Uh... Oh, let's see. Never mind. Yeah, there's probably like some academic yeah. paper that. Says yeah, this. and then I do have the data as well. Uh, so I'm just trying to see if the the data set's linked here also. Let's see here. Pre-trained. Never mind. But um, but yeah, I did find an article where it mentioned that they were the, these models were trained on 
a set of uh, images of cats and dogs. Yeah, the the Arvix thing on the on the right is what we'll really talk about that. But it's cool that these pre-trained models are there for, for people to use. Um, all the code and then, um, yeah, just how to set up your environment. So basically Conda, I'm using Conda to create a, a isolated environment, uh, Python 3.9, and then installing Snowpark for Python, Pandas, Notebook, Cache Tools, and then these other libraries um, separately using PIP. Once you have that, you update your connection JSON file with your credentials so you can um, connect to Snowflake. And then other than that, all you have to do is just create one table with two columns and then one stage for uploading the files, model files. And then it's as easy as calling streamlit run, name of the Python file, and that's how these get launched. So if I show you the terminal window, um, that's how I launched the two applications. This one, and then this is the second one on different port right here. Any other prompts that anyone want me to try? A parrot dressed up as a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> With the human on its shoulder. Huh? No, no, just do, do it. I was, I was a saying. A parrot dressed up as a pirate. As R. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's see what it does. <laughs> the mask. The mask. <laughs> okay. But, uh, <laughs> Let's just say a cat. I mean, it's pretty cool. Like, I'm not even specifying about breed. I'm just saying a cat. Let's just see what it does. I mean, I mean, it could be a lion. It could be a tiger. Who knows? Yeah, okay, Chihuahua. Interesting. That's a cat. Yeah. Right, but the image yeah. detection decided that was a Chihuahua. It's definitely cat-like. What if you say Dr. Evil's cat? Dr. Evil's cat? Yeah. <laughs> you don't eat our kitty. Tabby cat. Looks like him. Yeah. A um, a dog. Sorry, okay. and dog thing is sand. What what is a tabby anyway? A uh, type of a cat. Yeah, so I guess the coloring was a tabby coloring, huh? Mm -hmm. um, this is cool. And then uh, a uh, an animal in the uh, jungle. Wouldn't it be good to take a picture of that and then get a picture of an I, I, Ibizan hound and see if that's a, a good match? That's, mm. that's pretty specific. This is pretty cool. I mean, I didn't name the animal or anything, and then it's saying what it is. It's pretty neat. Madagascar cat. Yeah. Ringtail lemur. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, that is cool, especially since this is like 
AI layered over AI. Right. Right. Like, yeah, Dali, like it's all separate. Yeah. 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 We, don't, we don't know how good Dolly can do. And then this thing that you're showing us is making the best of that, which is. Right. You know. <laughs> But does it know that uh, Sasha Baron Cohen did the did the uh, <laughs> Madagascar? <laughs> Animal in the water. Let's see what happens. Eel. It's pretty neat. Anyone else want to share a prompt? We can try. How about a shrieking eel from the Princess Bride? <laughs> shrieking? Shrieking. Shrieking, yeah, like S H R I E. Yeah, R. Oh, R. Screaming. S H R I I E. E K I N G. E E L. That's it. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's really more of a moray eel, but yeah. I'm impressed that it got at all. Yeah. I don't know what they look like. <laughs> Do vegan cat. Vegan cat? <laughs> How do you know it's a vegan cat? Yeah. Well, it'll, it'll, it'll cross. Cross. The cat made out of tofu. They're obligate carn carnivores. That'll be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they're they're uh, was it poster? That's a sign. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If a cat was vegan, he'd definitely make a big deal out of it. <laughs> tiger cat. But the I mean, this is accurate. Tiger cat. Wow. Cool. Never heard of that before. The cheese. <laughs> oh, there we go. Dog breed. Wow. Uh, yeah. Up a couple clicks. There was a dog breed there. Oh, yeah, right here. <laughs> breed. No photos. But yeah. It, what about a rodent like of unusual size? Huh? It's more Princess Bride references. Rodent <laughs> of unusual size. What was the first part? A rodent of unusual oh, okay. size. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The R O U S is. Yep. Rodent. Uh, uh, yeah, there we go. Which sounds more charming than just big rat. <laughs> it can't be. Oh, but it calls it a beaver. Nice. <laughs> cool. Uh, so, so, yeah, Snowflake, I mean, Snowflake has come a long way in that definitely started out as a database data warehouse but now it has lots of different um, apis in it things like connectors to write applications using python java scala 
what have you, and all kinds of use cases and uh, and um, workloads, if you will. And like I said, uh, cool. please feel free to follow along. Uh, put the link if you get a chance, and uh, just shoot me any feedback that you may have. Well, this is awesome. Always love your presentations, Dash. I like how topical this one is. Generative AI is super, yeah, popular. Yeah, it's all it's all just Python, uh, except you know, just calling the Open AI API. Love it. All right. Well, does anyone have any more questions for Mr. Desai here? Awesome. All thank right, you, well, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, well, Dash, Tanim, thank you both for your contributions. And uh, thanks for everyone for showing up. I uh, hope to see you next month. Yeah, thanks for hosting me. And uh, thanks, everyone, thanks. for thanks. listening in. Anytime. All right, everyone. Cheers, have a good rest of your night or day, Dean. <laughs> Adios. All right. Bye -bye. Thank you.